Well, thanks for, for, for being here. Uh, we've got, for the Senate, at least five weeks left, 14 weeks behind us. Uh, and uh, when we get back, uh, I assume the leaders of the House and Senate are going to start working with the governor on the, the, the budget targets. Uh, but let me just say, uh, I'm a little troubled by the priorities that they've set. You know, the, uh, the budget bills reflect your priorities and your values. And I think that uh, there's significant problems with their lack of investment in K-12 education, uh, significant problems with their uh, lack of investment in uh, higher ed. And you just can't simply starve higher ed and then and, and say the institutions can't raise money through tuition uh, because curriculum falls apart and pretty soon you can't get done in four years. So the, the, the cuts in higher ed are, are, are problematic. Uh, you know, everyone knows I think we need dedicated ongoing funding for transportation and uh, what we've got is some general fund that uh, may be the best we can do but it's not sustainable. I've cautioned people uh, all session just if you're going to do that with general fund don't call it a plan because uh, the next legislature is going to come here with different priorities and transportation might not uh, be one of them. Uh, so kind of going through, and, and in, in health care and the Health and Human Service Bill, I'm very concerned being a rural member about the impact that it's going to have on rural hospitals who in most communities are struggling already, including my own. I had a little amendment on the floor today for my rural ambulance service in, in, under the Cook Hospital District. Uh, that's really problematic, pushing, uh, using different, when you have a surplus, you shouldn't have to use accounting gimmicks uh, and shifts uh, to, to balance the budget. Those are the kind of mechanisms that you use when you've got budget shortfalls, not when you actually have money. So that, uh, that's problematic. Uh, the tax bill, there's a lot of nice things in there, but it's just too big. And there is, uh, I would say, little or no chance that the governor is going to sign a bill of that uh, proportion. I hope that they realize that. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got a, a, a we're, we're going to get to appointing conferees next Tuesday when we get back. Uh, there were some votes for the budget bills by members kind of under duress, but they still wanted to be on the conference committee and be in the room and have an opportunity to work with the governor on trying to find uh, a solution that uh, is acceptable to him and to us and to in the best interest of Minnesotans. This budget really reflects what we want the quality of life to look like in our state going forward for the next two years. And I, I, uh, if, if I was still running the Senate with my Democratic colleagues, I can tell you the priorities look, would look much different. But with that, we've got some people that, that serve on the committees that can speak to uh, the deficiencies in, in their priorities. Thank you. Um, so we've had a chance to talk about education quite a bit in the, on the Senate floor over the past couple of days between the tax bill with the, the vouchers proposal and then on the E-12 bill as well. And um, I agree completely with what Senator Bach said. Um, in a time of a surplus, we should be doing better. Um, when you look at the tax credits that really are ultimately vouchers for education, that is money that could be going into our schools. And instead, it's, that's not where they're planning to send it. Uh, they'd rather make those tax deductions available for um, wealthy individuals and corporations. And at the same time, we are not keeping up with inflation in the funding of our public schools. And I had people in from my school districts today talking about the fact that there will be cuts, um, there, they, there will be increases in classrooms next year based on where we are right now. And in a time of surplus, that's just really troubling and confusing. I don't understand why. Um, I know my constituents don't understand why, and I'm pretty sure Minnesotans generally don't understand why. We know that these, this kind of funding level means that there will be cuts, there will be increases in uh, class sizes, or these will be passed back to uh, property tax payers in terms of, of local levies. So we need to do much better. Um, you know, I take people at their word who have said on a bipartisan basis that they want to see that target get higher. So we're going to continue to press for that because we think that's what's best for Minnesota's kids, that's what's best for our workforce, and that's what's best for Minnesota's future. Thank you. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, state government bill, which is pretty egregious in my opinion. 
Um, they're doing across the board cuts in uh, many areas, in almost all areas, and these are just arbitrary. It's not like we don't like this program, cut this out, but just arbitrary. And these are things you do when you have a deficit. And we had that all through the years with Plenty where you just had a cut because everybody had to share the pain. Now there's no deficit, so why are they doing this? Um, uh, just some examples, when revenue takes an $11 million cut, they have a $35 million loss in revenue. Um, and the property tax refunds that people are contacting us about, why is it late, why is it late? Turns out that it's late because um, uh, IDs are being stolen and, um, and, the, and the revenue has to check and make sure it's really you that is getting the refund. Uh, and so it's slowing things down and that takes staff to do that. And it's staff that they would cut when they do these, when they do these cuts. And the Secretary of State too, uh, adds $20 million to the general fund through the business services, and when you cut, you slow everything down. All this uh, gets, gets, gets uh, it's just short-sighted because then you uh, reduce your actual revenue. And elections require support and information, and it's staff that does that. You cut the staff. What do you have to focus on? You have to focus on the key things, the database, et cetera, and the services of getting out information will be reduced. And maybe election results on election night. You won't get those as fast. Things like this. Um, Illinois and Arizona had their databases in elections uh, uh, hacked. We wanted to make sure that we weren't having ours hacked. We had to buy, uh, hire a consultant to come in and check vulnerabilities. This is something we'll need to do more of because cybersecurity is a big thing. Um, you know, in 2004, when Mary Kiffmeyer was the Secretary of State, there were 112 staff and consultants. And 2011, a year that the Republicans are pointing at, there were 111 at the Secretary of State's office. Now there are 84, but somehow or other, those are too many. Uh, so it's services to Minnesota that we cut. And I just wanna make a little a few comments about cybersecurity. In 2014, recognizing that that's a few years ago, $575 billion industry for cybercrime and growing. Um, this is something where we're hack, 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 and they only have to be right once to cause a mess. We have to be right every time. This takes a great deal of staff and tools and services. We need, to, we need to fund those. We need to up our game in that. And instead, they're taking cuts in that. This is so short-sighted. Again, if we were hacked once, boom, there would be a huge cost to Minnesota. I think uh, uh, South Carolina had $20 million that they had to pay out for people who were hacked. So um, this is just putting the, re the Republicans putting their head in the sand and not good choices. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, you guys know me, my name is Jeff Hayden. Just want to talk a little bit about a couple of things. One is the health care budget, uh, as Senator Bach indicated, uh, the GOP plan essentially shifts money. Um, so they're going to delay payments uh, to uh, health care maintenance organizations. Uh, re, uh, do the rebasing or delay the rebasing of hospitals. We essentially, um, and I talked to my constituents and essentially say that we promised you an increase or raise to cover uh, your cost. Uh, we promised it to you, so now we're going to take your raise back. Um, and that's essentially uh, what they're doing. Um, and they're delaying payments uh, in the future um, for health maintenance organizations, which I find is interesting because we just went through this process of the reinsurance program, the insurance for insurance companies, and we've given out uh, close to a billion dollars to uh, health maintenance organizations, our insurers, to try to shore up the individual market. Um, and now we're actually going to pay them late, which also causes an issue actuarially with them. So where at one point the Republicans are given them money to say that they want to prime this individual market up, and on the other part, um, because they don't want to make the actual cuts to the constituencies that we know are most vulnerable, they're now causing actuarial, potential actuarial problems with those uh, same organizations by paying them late in order to free up some dollars. So one of the things that we've always said is it's, it's, it is a phony budget. It is a phony way in which to fund uh, the things that we need to do for Minnesotans. Um, I heard uh, Senator Housley, who uh, chaired the uh, you know, uh, long term in this uh, at a long term committee uh, looking at the elderly and talked about how many more people will have in 2020 that will actually uh, be uh, using those services because they're in the elderly. And she just, uh, with her in the leadership and others in the leadership, she just pushed out $600 million worth of debt to those folks that are going to actually need those services. So I'm not quite sure um, how that's going to work. Once again, uh, we were very concerned 
about the reinsurance proposal. Uh, not that we didn't believe that Minnesotans needed reinsurance, but one, we felt like if they were going to go in an IMSHA model, uh, the financing mechanism shouldn't have been out of the Health Care Access Fund and other places. It should have been what the, what the IMSHA model was before, which was an assessment on the industry, which helps to save them. Um, and so we're very concerned about that. We're also very concerned. The Republicans talked a lot about four and six years ago, and I was around about not taking uh, any, dem any Democratic or any Republican ideals when we were dealing with Minshore and the Affordable Care Act. So as we're in this position now, we've had some really good ideas. Senator Lori really led in reworking various proposals and looking at the Minnesota Care buy-in as a way to create access and reform in greater Minnesota. Uh, he worked tirelessly with both sides of the aisle. Um, we even got Senator Jensen one time to vote with us on that issue. He was very close to voting with us again. And the last proposal really upped the Medicaid rates, so helped the hospitals out, but ensured that if indeed they come out with a set of products and in places in greater Minnesota doesn't have the options that they're looking for, that they could opt into this Minnesota care buy-in and they denied that. So I think it's somewhat hypocritical to uh, complain about us uh, four and six years ago that we didn't take any of their amendments to try to make it better. And as we're now kind of moving forward and healthcare is turbulent as it is, the great ideas that we put on the table, they also uh, haven't taken. The last thing I'll talk about just a tad bit is this issue around equity. And many of you know that myself, Senator Champion, with uh, the support of our leadership, uh, did a package to really deal with this issue of uh, the gaps in employment and housing uh, and in education in communities of color versus uh, white Minnesotans. Um, last year, we put that proposal together. We got it passed bipartisanly. Uh, those dollars are now out working in the community. Uh, they were all uh, kind of appropriated. They were appropriated last year in last year's session, and they were um, let uh, uh, just this past uh, year. So uh, communities are just now, and organizations are now just getting that money. The GOP just simply cut it. Just sight unseen, with no reports, with no ideas. Uh, uh, there's half a million dollars to emerging enterprise fund, 1.5 million to grants to promote self-sufficiency, women in high wage and demands a million dollars, summer youth programs a million dollars, Southeast Asian community a million dollars, pathways to prosperity a million dollars, capacity grants a million dollars. And the most egregious was the home ownership. We have about a 30% gap in home ownership between African Americans and whites similar in other communities of color. Uh, Senator Westrom cut that in uh, through some examination on the floor by Senator Champion. Senator Westrom didn't know the numbers. He didn't know the organizations. He didn't know the people. It's what we thought, that it was simply just on their cut target without any examination what these dollars do and if they're doing. But at the same time, uh, one of the things that they said in the Education com uh, Committee was the $35 million was really targeted to low-income people, especially African Americans in North Minneapolis. Um, however, all the things that help their family stabilize, they cut. So I just wanted to make that point. I think that that's really important. And I agree with Senator Bach that um, our budget is a reflection of our values, uh, and uh, we really believe that uh, the things that the GOP has done um, are not good for Minnesotans. Senator Bach, how much of this do you think is just bargaining chips with looking towards the governor, particularly, you know, Senator Hayden mentions the equity monies. I mean, how much of it is just take something out so you can put it back in and say, we gave you something, now give us something? Well, that's a pretty old strategy, and, and uh, how much of it, I don't know. But, you know, time is going to get pretty short when we get back. I mean, I mean the governor set, sent a letter uh, to the leaders saying he wanted to have uh, conference committee budget targets established by the 28th of April. Uh, I support that. Uh, the bills are all now in conference, so there's really no reason that when they get back here on the 18th, in the course of 10 days, they can't sit down with the governor and figure out how much they're going to spend in each one of the, the budget areas. And if we're going to get out of here on time, I think that's pretty critically important that they engage the governor and, and get, that, uh, get that done by the 28th of, of April. That's really kind of the next uh, marker, I guess, is, is that date on the 28th when we get back. So I hope they get to work in earnest with the governor uh, and accomplish that. And you know, that's having, you know, having been the leader trying to establish targets, that's the hardest thing. You know, it's, it's relatively easy to establish targets in your caucus for all of the 
uh, budget divisions and, and nobody gets everything that they want and there's always uh, some complaining about how the money, leadership decided the money should be distributed. But it's a lot harder when you've got to involve uh, the House and the governor and come to an agreement. And uh, Senator Gazelka is going to find out how hard that is. It's uh, pretty difficult. But I am very concerned how far away the House is starting from the governor. Uh, to Senator Gazelka's and the Senate's credit, uh, we're in a much different place in the negotiations than the House is, uh, closer to where the governor is. And, and I said yesterday uh, that the Senate position is going to have to move, move towards the governor before the end of this session. And, the Senate has a shorter distance to go, but the House has a long distance to go to get uh, to, I think, what is going to be a, an acceptable conclusion for the governor. So are you optimistic that things will work out? Well, uh, I, uh, I don't see any reason that this can't be resolved. I mean, we've got $1.6 billion of surplus money. That is adequate resources uh, to to put a budget together. It's nowhere near as hard as the years we were trying to manage deficits and, and figure out uh, you know, what was going to get nothing or what was going to have to be cut or what was going to have to be shifted. None of that has to happen this year. There is adequate resources uh, to meet the governor's number in, in education and in higher ed. Plenty of money to do that. I think where they've got to get sensible is on their tax bill. And I, they have totally overreached on their tax bill in both the Senate and the House. And uh, I think the point they're missing on that is the governor doesn't need one. He just doesn't need one. And we haven't had one the last two years, and, and the state's been doing just fine. And uh, if, if they don't get serious about a tax bill, that's just not going to happen. And, but the budget does have to happen. So I, I think if they can get their, their tax bill spending number down to somewhere where the governor is, I think uh, it's pretty easy to accomplish a a budget that we that can get strong bipartisan support uh, going home in May. There's plenty of money to do it. And you want to really make it easy? The Republicans could take $800 million and the governor could take $800 million and each spend it. And, and we can just go home. And you know what? I bet you we'd get a pretty decent outcome. Uh, it actually could be that simple. You have other bills that don't have to be done. Transportation, bonding, or a couple come to mind. Where are they? Transportation, bonding, any chances? Well, to, uh, to Senator Sendrum's uh, credit, uh, although I don't support his bill, and I told him that the day he rolled out the spreadsheet, uh, he, he didn't, you know, we spent all, all summer and fall and into December, uh, the four leaders and the governor trying to negotiate a special session, a tax bill and a bonding bill, and we got to a place where everyone agreed on, the previous leaders all agreed on that. And uh, so when Senator Sendrum put his bill together, he went back and picked up a bill from May that uh, Senator Stump's bill, it doesn't reflect any of the governor's priorities in it. And, and, and it's not even fair to say it was Senator Stump's bill. It was $800 million of Senator Stump's bill that was $1.5 billion. So he, he took pieces out of Senator Stump's bill, and he, and he continues to call it that. Uh, but I immediately sent him a, a, a text message and said, David, you need to start with the special session negotiated bill where the governor had buy-in, and we were pretty close to a bill, I think, that uh, could have had strong bipartisan support. But for some reason, we started to go back to May to put a bill together. But uh, to his credit, he's at least moved one to the floor and a couple vehicles to the floor, and it appears like uh, in, in the Senate they want to do a bonding bill. I, I get no sense in the House that there's any interest in it at all, uh, moving a bonding bill forward. And unfortunately, it has to originate there. So. Uh, but, I, but uh, there have been conversations going on that uh, the, the Republican majorities will consider a bonding bill once a tax bill is signed into law. Um, so unless they get serious about a tax bill that the governor can support, if their word is good, there's not going to be a bonding bill. And on transportation, I think there's probably going to be some general fund money. Uh, uh, they're uh, very reluctant to... Uh, to raise any dedicated revenue, constitutionally dedicated revenue, whether it's through license tabs or, or the gas tax. I think that's the right thing because that creates a transportation plan. Uh, with constitutionally dedicated money, we can sell bonds and get a lot more projects going by selling bonds than we can by just uh, using cash. So my guess is we're probably going to, the, the, the reluctance to, to get any new constitutionally dedicated money probably leaves us with the option of 
doing something with some general fund and doing a few projects around the state, and uh, that that'll be a tremendous disappointment. Uh, but I and I have not talked to the governor about transportation yet. Uh, but you know, he proposed, like the Senate did in 13 and 15, uh, a gas tax that provides some constitutionally dedicated money. But it doesn't seem like we're going to get there. The speaker seems to be sharpening his rhetoric, his criticism of the governor of late. Is that a, a bad sign uh, heading into these negotiations or, or just typical? Um... Well, I don't think it's helpful. Uh, you know, there's, uh, we all have feelings and uh, sometimes we all get our feelings hurt and, you know, and when you, when someone kind of keeps poking at you and poking at you and poking at you, it, 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 it leaves a residue. And, uh, you know, people start to stake out positions harder than they maybe otherwise would have and are a little bit more unwilling to compromise when they feel like they've been kind of continually picked on. Uh, I, I, I'm pleased that I don't see Senator Gazelka taking that approach in the Senate. Uh, I just don't think it's helpful to a, a final conclusion. But, uh, you know, the Speaker's got some other ambitions, and, and uh, everybody knows it. Whether he'll follow through on it, I don't know. But, you know, that may be part of his part of his strategy there, but if, if he is serious about that, it's going to make finding a conclusion here a little bit different uh, and more difficult. But don't you have some other ambitions, maybe, also? Should we I, look at I, you the same way? I have, I have one ambition that I think about every day, including today. I had a long conversation with Senator Cohen about how we flipped the majority, 34-33, the other <laughs> way. And that is what I am spending all of my political considerations on, and it's going to continue to be that way until I make that flip. And it's going to happen before 2020, because there are a number of different paths and uh, I, I just, uh, I don't think the outcome of this election was meant to be. And, and I am somebody that believes when things aren't meant to be, they don't hold. So walk us so. through some of these options. <laughs> <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Not today. Senator, on education, I was looking through some of the spreadsheets comparing the House, the Governor, and the Senate plan. And it looks like the House and the Senate provide far more money for charter schools than they do the regular school district. Is that the case? And if so... What's your reaction to that? I have to say I did not specifically look at that aspect of it. Um, I know that we have been talking about some financing for charter schools, um, so that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I'm, I'm just not clear on those particular details. Since you're up there, tell us what are, are the Republican bills uh, ignoring suburbs? Um, I don't think they. I don't think you could say they're ignoring suburbs. You know, um, they they don't do as well certainly as the governor's budgets do. When I look at you know the suburban districts, the governor's budget does a lot more for the suburban districts. Um, but uh, you know, it's the 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 problem with the Republican bills is that they don't do enough for anybody. You know, so it, it, it's it's. I would say that to Senator Nelson's point, she tried to have a fair bill, so it's evenly balanced but evenly balanced and not meeting the needs of the schools and the kids that they, that they serve. You know, if I, just kind of on that, some of the challenges that we had, especially in the, in the education bill, not that and Senator Kent clearly is the, the expert on that, but I, I got a little irritated at the direction about the achievement gap, especially with the education tax credits. Um, and one of the things was that they cut... Uh, funds to the promised neighborhoods in North and North Minneapolis and in St. Paul that is really focusing in a holistic way on cutting the achievement gap. So they set a target. Uh, Senator Nelson talks glowingly about them. Um, they talk about the tax credits as being something to deal with the achievement gap. Senator Chamberlain and others had these big hearings. But their values is to kind of is to take away money from those neighborhoods, take money away from those schools and take money away from education projects that have demonstrated good outcomes for those children, and then they take those away and send it to other places. So as you look at the spreadsheet, sometimes, uh, to Rachel's point, sometimes what you see is much different than what you hear. I'm, there, there's a couple things I'm a little bit surprised about, because I, I really thought with uh, bringing so many new Republican members from rural Minnesota into the legislature, that there'd be more of a rural emphasis on this session. And I am pretty surprised at the lack of investment in broadband, which 
I mean, we're all talking expanding broadband and how important it is, and it's largely a rural problem, uh, the lack of broadband. And, you know, we managed to find last year $35 million in a non-budget year, in a supplemental budget uh, for additional broadband deployment. And this year, in a budget year, when uh, the Broadband Task Force recommended $100 million and the governor recommended 60, uh, I don't know where this, the House is at. I think their bill's up on the floor today or tomorrow, but the Senate, I think we're at 20 million, and that doesn't seem like enough in what I thought was gonna be a good year for rural Minnesota. And the other area I was very surprised at is I had spent some time over the summer and fall meeting with the Rural School Board Association because I really wanted to do something for small schools, which are, for the most part, rural. So I put a bill together at Senate File 87 uh, that put some additional money on the formula for small schools with less than, less than 1,500 pupils. Uh, Senator Gazelka signed on it with me as an author. He said, Tom, that's a really good idea. Uh, and I couldn't get a hearing. Can you imagine that? In, in, uh, Senator Nelson decided to not even hear the bill. And when Senator Thomasoni, when their education bill was marked up in committee, uh, tried to offer it as an amendment, she deliberately put a poison pill on to take money away from Minneapolis and St. Paul to make sure that that wasn't going to pass. In, in I mean, a, a downright attack on small rural schools. And that's pretty surprising to me. And the, the, and the other issue is on local government aid. I mean, $12 million one time, an LGA one time, now, when you take that back, the truth is two years from now, LJ is actually going to be going down because of the way the formula works uh, in most cities, in about 600 of the 850 cities. So no investment in uh, the state being a stronger partner in those rural towns that have don't have a lot of tax capacity, but a fire truck costs the same there as in some more wealthy community and who need some state support. No, no investment in rural schools, no investment in broadband, which is largely rural, it's pretty surprising in a year where I think people kind of thought that with all these new rural members coming in, that there would be some emphasis on rural Minnesota, and I just haven't seen it. Senator Hayden, what, what's it feel like to be a legislator from Minneapolis this session? Uh, <laughs> well, say a little more about that, Tim. I don't know, you know. Well, Senator Bach talked about the uh, accumulative effect of pokes, and it, it seems like uh, your city is getting yeah, I mean, Minneapolis has always kind of been, you know, a target um, for those guys. Um, I will say that I'm pretty proud of our caucus. Um, you know, there's, you know, sometimes late in the night there's a snafu or though, but I think our caucus really understands how important it is for the state to be strong. And if the state is strong, it means that um, that the metro is strong. And in the, the center of the metro, obviously, is Minneapolis. State has put a lot of investments uh in our biggest city um, that has our safety net hospital. Um, we've obviously put a lot in entertainment. Um, it's gonna, we're gonna draw a lot of people uh, to Minneapolis that's gonna help the state. So I think that our caucus uh, understands uh, how important Minneapolis is. And then thus, Minneapolitan and even St. Paul legislators understand how important it is to get uh, these dollars out to greater Minnesota. I know that I talked about the equity. Well, if you go back and look at the bill, a good amount of that money proportionately went to communities around greater Minnesota that have these same type of issues. So, um, you know, I, I told people it's tough being in the minority and it's sometimes it's tough being in Minneapolis, but I was born in the minority. And so uh, <laughs> I understand how it is that you have to fight for that. Well, how big a deal is that LGA hit that came in the tax bill debate the other day? Yeah, I think I'm gonna let Senator Rock talk a little bit more about kind of how that actually plays out. It's bad for the state. Um, if that would happen the way that it worked. Um, I think that that was just one of those poison pills and once again kind of late um, in the evening um, it just kind of get, got through and we hope to fix that. Um, but it does illustrate and I was able, I was out at caucuses which were uh, a lot of turnout. Um, a lot of good folks in Minneapolis were really engaged, uh, I think double the turnout, um, are engaged in that and uh, we talked about uh, kind of what that means in uh, once again, you know, not to be overly political and in a political environment, that's just not good for the state. Um, I think I got up and talked about this idea that if you're an executive from wherever in the state and you work at the IDS Center and you have a heart attack, when you push 911, the first responders are the Minneapolis Police Department, Minneapolis Fire Department, and you're liable to go 
uh, to the state's, one of the state's largest safety net hospital, Hennepin County Medical Center, which is one of the best level one trauma centers uh, in the region. Uh, that has to be supported, and that's a state. And anybody in the state can go there. If you're driving up 35 and getting an accident, if you're in a hunting accident, often, depending on the severity, the, the uh, helicopter is going to take you to HCMC. So those things are really, really important, and I think we realize that, and we hope uh, to rectify that as these bills get into conference. And I would just, um, just add in that point, um, one of the things that I think has been most disappointing from the recent conversations is how divisive it is being across the board. We're pitting parts of the state against each other in our transportation budget that has been proposed by Republicans, um, in the education plan, uh, in health and human services, and now in these particular movements with LGA and others. And it's just not healthy, because what we all know is that this is a highly interdependent state. And um, we all do better um, as, a, as a state when all of the com component regions are doing well. And so, you know, to attack regular bus service transit in, in throughout the state, that's not just a metro issue, um, that's, that's not helpful. You know, we need, we have, we have the, the DFL caucus has continually looked at transportation on a holistic basis, you know, around the state, multimodal. Um, and, you know, to, to do it the way that is being proposed now is purely divisive. It's purely um, a, a political maneuver. And it's just not good for Minnesota. I, uh, I, I did talk to the Minneapolis Council president uh, earlier today, and because uh, she's very concerned about it. And uh, I assured her that I thought it would get fixed. That it was, uh, you know, this came from uh, Senator Nelson again in Rochester, uh, just like when she went after Minneapolis and St. Paul on the schools. Uh, I don't quite understand that. Uh, Minneapolis, especially, and, and St. Paul to some extent, have a tremendous amount of overburden. Uh, you know, all those towers down there, all those people driving in that aren't residents of the city, that aren't paying taxes there, uh, create a lot of pressure on Minneapolis's infrastructure. All of those sporting and arts and culture things down there that people come in to visit put a, a lot of stress on the, on the community's infrastructure. So I, I do think the state, because of all of that uh, outside burden that's put on their infrastructure by all the rest of us, I, I think we've got some obligation that all of the burden of that those public services, police and fire and, and streets and, and everything that has to be provided for all the rest of us that visit there, uh, we have some obligation, the rest of us, to help that, that city provide that so it doesn't totally fall on just the residents of the city of Minneapolis. I just don't think that's unreasonable. And uh, that's a tremendous amount of overburden that they have. And uh, we're gonna, I think that's one of the things that will get fixed, uh, just like the all the cuts to the gut to the governor state agencies. I don't think that's a serious proposal. I think to Rachel's point, when uh, when we actually get down to the nitty gritty of the negotiating, that's probably one of the first things that's going to get thrown out. The question will be in that process, what do they uh, what do they think that they can extract from the governor for restoring his funding? But I I, I just don't see any path where we would go home with state that the governor would agree to a budget that has cuts in his state agencies at a time when we have 1.6 billion dollars of surplus dollars. Did you say something about the divisiveness? I, a lot of it is rhetoric. Now, I think before um, we had the change in D.C., and the rhetoric was that most people hated Obamacare. And now the, the fact is 55% don't touch my Obamacare. So uh, reality changes, and the rhetoric um, sometimes um, is not accurate. Just heard a... a, a um, Report from the Environmental Partnership regarding doing a survey across the state of ideas around uh, environmental provisions. It was commissioned by both the a leading national Republican uh, polling firm and a leading Democratic polling firm. They together worked on wordage and did the, did the survey to get as clear as we could as what do Minnesotans think about environmental provisions. And uh, the one that sticks out in my mind is as far as regulations go, we've been told uh, don't, want, don't want more regulations on, on environment. We want to cut back on regulations. You'd think that would be clear in the outstate. There were no differences, basically, on anything between rural and metro. And they meant 5-7 county metro, Duluth and Rochester as metro. No differences, hardly at all, between rural and metro on any of these things. And as far as enforcement goes, um, majority wanted greater or much greater uh, regulations and enforcement. About, I think it was about a 20% that said they're fine the way they are, 
and there was only 12% that wanted less. Across the state of Minnesota, 12% want less regulations across the environment. So sometimes I think the rhetoric is not accurate. What do you folks expect your constituents to be telling you and your colleagues in the next week? Well, <laughs> um, I got a good chance to speak to a lot of my constituents during the, this past caucus process, though I would say, you know, it was going to be certainly the activists that come out, but it's kind of what my district is as a whole. <laughs> um, I think that people are just really, really concerned. Um, and it starts in Washington and the, unst the instability, I guess, in Washington uh, between the Trump administration and just every day it seems like it's a bad Saturday Night Live skit um, to then how many, you know, really, really wealthy top tier people are kind of running this country to the proposals, everything from cutting uh, Elmo and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and, um, and then cutting grandma's food uh, via Meals on Wheels really, really frightens people. So what they're saying to me is they're really hoping that not only can we get our job done, but that hopefully the state uh, will be prudent and be able to insulate them or help them if the federal uh, budget comes out and it is bad for people as uh, they, they have proposed. And we know that there's a long ways to go there, but they certainly are asking us not to spend every uh, single dime on small tax breaks or tax breaks for the wealthy and would hope that we would be prudent enough to weather the storm until that situation gets uh, a little more stable in Washington. Well, my district is a little different than Senator Hayden's. <laughs> um, and, but I'm hearing very similar things, you know, that this is a time of surplus and uh, they want to make sure that we are investing in the things that make us strong for the future. And those are things that we all understand, education um, from K-12, early learning and higher education, um, our infrastructure, just the basics. And that is what I am hearing. And what's interesting is how much I'm hearing it. I, you know, uh, the, the feedback I'm getting uh, from calls and emails and constituent visits and at our, uh, our town halls is um, really elevated this year compared to what we've seen in the past. And I think it is because people are concerned about the direction that they're hearing coming out of leadership, both at the state level and federally. I'll just uh, quickly say that in my district, which is 60-40 Democrat, the people are engaged. They came out twice the number to town meetings to just uh, be more progressive to, to fight that fight. So people are getting engaged for real. Well, I, uh, I think as long as at, at, at the end of the day we spend the surplus on something that people value, that they think is important, I, I think it'll be a good outcome. And my example of that is, you know, a number of years ago we gave counties the authority to raise the sales tax for transportation. And three of my counties did that. St. Louis County, which is a large county, and, and I represent a lot of it. Uh, Cook County has done it. Lake County has done it. Uh, Cook, or Cushington County is considering it. Three of those four counties have raised the sales tax by a half a percent, and I have not gotten one email from a constituent protesting a half a percent increase in the sales tax. And that's a significant sales tax increase, but not one because that what they know is it's going to something that I want fixed. And I think uh, if at the end of this session we in invest more money in uh, the things that have made this state great, in, in uh, uh, E-12 education and in higher ed uh, and in transportation uh, and we don't overreach on the, on the tax side, I, there's, there's plenty of money here to have a very successful session that, that, that I think meets the needs of Minnesotans. And the question will just be if they're willing to get reasonable. And I think the frosting on it all would be if we could find a deal and do a bonding bill and invest in some of this deteriorating infrastructure out there. But that is absolutely, totally out of our control in the minority. Uh, uh, we can't get a bill if the House never decides to ever put one on the table and send one over to the Senate. What about your district and Trump? Wasn't it pretty much split in the November election? How, how are they reacting now? You know, I never looked at the final numbers on Trump in my district, but Hillary Clinton did win uh, my district. And, uh, uh, you know, Rick Nolan, a Democrat, I, I mean, uh, beat uh, Hillary Clinton by like 40,000 votes, right? Uh, but 
Trump was stronger there than a Republican normally would have been. And I, I think some of that was, a, some of it was around the gun issue. He, he, people felt he had a better, uh, better position on guns, and guns in rural Minnesota matter. And, uh, uh, and clearly the trade issue. I mean, he was speaking right to people coming off of a steep steel recession where more than half of the range was shut down. And he was talking about imported steel and redoing the trade agreements. So he was, he was speaking to what I think is the most important thing for people, the economic security of their families. And, uh, and that's what Rick Nolan was doing, same thing. I mean, all the jobs, all the ads that I saw that he ran on TV talked about mining and manufacturing. And he was speaking right to the heart of families' number one issue, that the security of their family is safe. And I think if candidates speak to that, I still think that is the most important thing to people, is that their family is uh, got the security that that uh, that they need. And now with Trump in office, is he still resonating with people in your area? You know, I, you know, it, I don't know because I'm not home enough now to to network with people. Uh, I expect uh, by the end of the summer, I can probably give you an answer on that. But what I don't know is how people are going to react when uh, nothing happens on the trade agreements. Right, the wall doesn't get built. Right, and the whole list of things Obamacare is not repealed. And the whole list of things that he said he was going to do when they don't happen, how are they going to react? And, 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 you know, not unlike what happened to Obama after eight years. Remember when he ran in eight, all the signs change. Yes, we can. And eight years later, they didn't feel like they got what they, what, what, what they were after. And uh, that's why it's very difficult for any political party to get a third term, is people want, or just there's a natural tendency that things can be better. And, Things aren't going well enough, and so we're going to change something. And that's, I think, what happened with, with, with Trump up north is he was, because we were so fresh off that steep recession, uh, his message was resonating with people. And it wasn't necessarily Republican, because if it was, Rick Nolan wouldn't have done so well. It, or Thomas Sony. I mean, <laughs> we, uh, I think Hillary Clinton, up north at least, had a messaging problem. And, but she won the state, which was her goal. So she did in Minnesota what she needed to do. Right? Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a, Thank have a good break. All right, have a good break.